Welcome, welcome to the Mysterious Book Emporium. Valia has found the diary of Isia, the mysterious sister of the hero of the Fourth Blight, but it seems to be bringing more questions than answers. What happens next? Why don't you take a seat as we start Last Flight by Leanne Marseille, chapters 9 through 18. Chapter 9, 941 Dragon. Valia asked the Chamberlain of the Grey what happened to the Griffins. She had been working in his library for about a month now, and over that time felt comfortable enough that she could ask him this question. He tells her that he is not sure the exact answer. Many died fighting the Fourth Blight, and many young were stillborn in their eggs. The species just grew weak, and they died out. But Valia doesn't believe it. Not that she thinks the Chamberlain would lie, but that he just doesn't know the real answer. Neither does she, but she felt like there was some hope. Her duties with the Chamberlain finish, she goes off to join the other Hosberg mages in the research, but finds that they have already left for their lunch break. The only one left in the library is Remus, the new female Templar. Valia tries to walk by, but Remus calls out to her, asking her to sit. Valia, remembering her time in the circle, is obviously anxious, but does so anyway. Remus tells her that she wants Valia to not be afraid of her or the other Templars. Not everyone joins the Templars to crush mages. When Valia asks what other reason could there be, Rhymus goes on to explain that her father was an apostate who did his best to hide his gifts. One day, he heard that someone told the Templars on him and he would be taken away. So, out of fear, he filled his pockets with stones and walked into the lake. She continues that she was very angry with the Templars after that, for how they caused her father's death, how coldly they treated her and her family members. As she grew up, she realized that what she wanted to do was keep others from the same fate as her father, and the best way to do that was to become a Templar, and to do the job the way it was supposed to be done. And as she believes that the Order has strayed too far from the job of protecting mages, she left, and that's why she's joined the Grey Wardens. Valia is surprised at her story, but is confused as to why she is telling her this. Remus explains that she just wanted to let her know that she doesn't need to fear a fellow comrade. But Valia coldly gets up, saying that she has made her point, and takes Isia's journal and leaves. Chapter 10 519 Exalted It's been about seven years since Isia helped save the people of Wycombe. Her, Garahel, Kaelin, and Amadis have been stationed in Hosberg in the Anderfels this whole time. The city has been under constant siege by the Darkspawn since then. It's in a back and forth battle, and no matter how many Darkspawn they kill, more keep coming back. The city would have fallen long ago were it not for the Grey Wardens and their Griffins bringing its supplies. Today, Issia and Kayla, along with other Wardens on Griffinback, are drawing the attention of the Darkspawn Horde so that a supplies drop can be given to the city in peace. While not a difficult job, it is a dangerous one. The group is able to kill a large group of the spawn, but Issia is bitter. No matter how many they kill, more will keep coming. Unless, she thinks, they are able to cut off reinforcements. Kayla notices her thoughtfulness and questions what she's thinking. When she tells him, he questions how she would be able to retract the Darkspawn to the Deep Roads Tunnel that they've been using. Isia says that she plans to use Kaelin. After all of their years of fighting together, she has noticed what he is. A blood mage. She says the words quietly, and even if the winds didn't carry her words, he saw the accusation on her lips and goes pale. But between them, they've been fighting together for years, and he knows that she won't harm him with this knowledge. She asks if he could control a dark spawn, lead it to the deep roads, and he says he can. So, they hatch a plan. They will tell the others that on their journey back, they saw a dark spawn acting oddly and followed it. Rivas is able to track down a small group of the creatures. Isia has to protect one Genlock from being ripped apart by Rivas's claws. Kaelin goes over to the trap Genlock, cutting his palm for the blood he needed, and in an instant, the Genlock freezes, and like a sleepwalker, heads off into the direction of the deep roads entrance. He tells Isia that he ordered it to go back to the Deep Roads, and they only need to follow it to find the entrance they seek. Back in the air, Rivas makes lazy circles as they watch the Jinlock walk. After they've been trailing their quarry for some time, Kalem stirred. You'll keep my secret. Of course I will, Isia said, watching the Jinlock. In all the years she'd been fighting the Blight, she had never seen anything like that. A darkspawn utterly enthralled to a warden's will. She glanced back at the other mage. I want you to teach it to me. Chapter 11 519 Exalted. Issy reports back to her brother they have found the main entrance to the Deep Roads. As they talk, Amadis comes up and puts her arm around Garahel. The two have just become absolutely shameless about their relationship, but Issia didn't mind too much. It's a blight, after all. Who cares about etiquette? Issia and Garahel plan to collapse the entrance, which seems to just be an opening in the surface and much easier to shut than a true dwarven entrance would be. They plan to bring a small handful of mages on Griffin Riders to shut the hole the next morning. 
Garahel and Amadis walk off, and Isia takes care of Ravas, but she notes that Kaelin still lingers. Isia asks if he is leaving, and he questions why she wants to learn blood magic. She asks why he learned, and he explains. As an Antivan crow, he was given the task to kill an apostate by the Templars. Later, he learned that the woman he was tasked to kill was an abomination. It took several crows to weaken her, and many died in the process. Seeing her last moments, she had made a deal with Kaelin. She would teach him blood magic if he healed her. He agreed. In that moment, memories of how to use blood magic had been planted into his brain. Being a crow, which meant he did have some armor, he did actually heal her for a small amount, but did kill her. He goes on to say that he remembers the implanted memories better than some of his own. Does Isia really want to become a Maleficarium? But she does. It's merely a weapon, and she needs everything she can to end the blight. The two spend the entire night practicing blood magic. The two of them had their heads spinning, Isia by the possibilities and Kaelin from the relief he felt of being able to share his secret. Healing their wounds as the first servants begin to awaken, they join the others for breakfast. While talking to the other wardens, Isia learns that Garahel has begun to tell the people that the wardens plan to break the siege of Hosburg, and the people are excited. Over the years, Garahel has been given the temporary title of Field Commander in Hosburg. While it does not hold outside of the city, he commands all the wardens' activity inside of it. Isia joins her brother, Kaelin, and Amadis at a table, saying that they have made a temporary battle map out of their food. He assigns them four mages along with a handful of other wardens to collapse the entrance. Garahel looks to his sister and says that she looks exhausted because he's worried about her health and she's going to be leading the charge. Isia is surprised that he won't be going, but Garahel explains that he has things to do. But he knows that she won't disappoint him in her mission, because she never could. Chapter 12 519 Exalted The opening to the deep rose is merely a rip in the earth, and standing over it, Isia can smell the corruption inside. The taint on the walls makes it difficult to see how large the cavern actually goes. Isia is joined by Kaelin, a warden mage named Dinaro, and another named Lizme. Lizme is an unusual person, as she drastically changes her appearance using makeup and wigs to even change which gender she is presented as. Today, she wears a wig made of fishing nets with pretty fish scales glued to her face, looking very feminine. The other mages debate on what the best way to close the opening, with Lizme wondering if perhaps the hole is bigger than they realize. But suddenly, the sound of herlock footsteps ring out. The darkspawn are coming. Together, the mages use their power to collapse the tunnel, but Lizme ends up being right, as part of the ground falls under them, sucking Isia, Lizme, Denaro, and a few other wardens into a sinkhole, and it's helped along by Darkspawn mages. As the wardens tumble down, Darkspawn hands begin to rise out of the rubble, attacking them. Isia looks down to find some already dead, one being torn apart. Lizme is able to keep them at bay by hurling fire at the rising spawn, burning herself in the process. Denaro's griffin, Shrike, swoops down in an attempt to save his rider but can't get a good footing to take off again. Isia watches as Shrike bites into the darkspawn, meaning that the poor griffin will be tainted. But she can see the determination in his eyes. He wants to save Denaro, and his efforts pay off, grabbing the man with his claws and is able to take flight off to Hosburg. Isia herself is in trouble, but manages better than most. Ravash shrieks overhead, not being able to save her rider. Isia is able to climb up out of the pit enough for Rivas to take her to safety, watching as Kaelin help Lizme out of the disaster. She is heavily burned but alive, and her griffin, Hunter, shrieks in delight to find his partner alive. Isia calls out to Lizme that if she can fly, and she says she can. She tells her to take a message to Garahel, that they need more griffins to pick up the remaining wardens who survived, and that they have succeeded. And with that, Lizme and Hunter fly off. Chapter 13 519 Exalted Dinaro, wounded but alive, asks Issy if there's anything she can do for Shrike. The poor beasts have been tainted while saving him, and Dinaro just doesn't want his beloved griffin to become a ghoul. Issy wonders for a bit on what to do, and has a suggestion. Let Shrike take the joining. Dinaro notes that it was tried long ago, and the results were so awful it was never tried again. The griffin had gone mad, killing all it could before tearing itself apart. Griffins are prideful beasts, and they can't handle the wrongness of the blight in them in any amount. But Isia has a plan. None of the wardens who had tried the process were blood mages. She believes she could force Shrike to accept himself, to make sure that he doesn't go mad and kill everyone in sight. And so she wants to try again. Denaro is quiet, but tells her that she can try. Just anything to help Shrike. Isia goes off to find her brother, then. He's in a meeting with the royals and the Anderfels and how the breaking of the siege would play out. She quietly asks him for his joining materials and is met with questioning looks. She has never wanted to recruit a member of the Order before. 
but he gives her a key to what she needs, and when she leaves, Issy is stopped by Queen Regent of the Anderfels, Merowyn. While she may have been the ruler, she had left the major work to her commander, Uvasha, preferring to focus on men and other unnecessary things. She asks Issia about Garahel, admitting that she is a big admirer of his. I'm sure Garahel's very flattered, Issia said. I wouldn't know, Merriwen's smile went brittle. Of course I have tried to tell him, but again, he has so little time. But it's my great hope that this will change once the siege breaks. When this dreadful war is over and Uvasha can go back to tending to more mundane matters, then perhaps he'll finally have the luxury of being able to enjoy a queen's admiration. Isia's eyes narrowed, but she nodded once, curtly. She wondered what her brother would say, and what Amadis might do, once he heard that the queen intended to hold the Anderfell's future cooperation hostage to her demands. I'll relay the message. With that, Isia slips into Garahel's room and grabs what she needs. She finds Shrike curled up in his pen, which is unusual for even a sick griffin. The blight sickness has quite progressed for how long it has been. Isia mixes the ingredients together and carefully cuts a small bit of Shrike's foot. Using the magic that Kaelin taught her, she goes into Shrike's mind. Accept this, she willed, and Shrike opened his beak. His eyes were glassy and unseeing, but inside his thoughts spun and flailed in sudden panic. No, 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 filled Shrike's skull in a terrified thunder. He fought against her intrusion with the desperation and futility of a dragonfly caught in a spider's web. No, accept this. Isia repeated, and gently but firmly forced the griffin's mind wider. She reached back to take the chalice and carefully tipped it into Shrike's beak, willing the transfixed griffin to swallow several times as she emptied the mixture of spell-touched lyrium and blood down his throat. Shrike's pen had built until Isia was afraid that he would break his mind against hers. She tightened her grip, venturing deeper into his emotions and memory until she reached the very core of the griffin's identity. There she rewove the thoughts that she found, snipping strands of remembrance and feeling and layering others in their places. She weakened Shrike's hatred of Darkspawn and pushed the sense of loathing away from what he'd become since ingesting their taint. In place of those emotions, she braided together acceptance and forgetfulness, blurring the details of what he'd become and altering the Griffin's perspective so that it seemed less awful. She masked the sense of alien sickness in him, bending the Griffin's thoughts so that he would believe it was only a cold, a cough, some transient illness that accounted for him not feeling quite like himself. Slowly, she leaves Shrike's mind, and the griffin already looks better than he was, despite being asleep. The griffin coughs once as if suffering from a cold, but continues to slumber. She finds Denaro first, who asks how it went, and Isia is honest with him. She isn't sure, but something has happened. Chapter 14 519 Exalted Lizme watches the darkspawn through an eyeglass. He still bears pink scars from when they had brought down the entrance to the Deep Rose, but he had made it part of today's costume, cutting his wig and fake mustache around the wounds. The Grey Wardens has set up a trap of sorts, a pile of weapons around pyres of the dead. While this was common custom on Thetis, this wasn't actually something done in the Anderfels. Due to the lack of resources, they don't burn any useful weapons. Inside the pyres, though, were rocks etched with lyrium runes to cause massive explosions. Whenever the Darkspawn would take the weapons, it would set off the runes. Isia leads a small company of wardens tasked to clean up after the traps explode, killing any part of the horde that doesn't die outright. The rest of the wardens would start attack another part of the horde not too far by. Shrike and Denaro are part of Isia's company, although they stand apart from the others. Shrike had become irritable, attacking many minus his rider. Other griffins kept their distance from him as well. Isia hears the trumpets calling the attack on the horde, and they watch as masses of darkspawn find their way to the trapped weapons. They watch as there is a mad scramble and the sudden burst of energy that disintegrates the majority of the group that had come over to loot the weapons. Isia calls for her troops to attack, and they are able to massacre the entire part of this horde. As Isia turns her attention to the larger battle, she notices that Shrike has gone over on his own, Denaro desperately trying to rein him in with no luck. The griffin begins to attack three ogres, and even as they grab him, he is able to fight them back. Kaelin, riding beside Isia, asks what she did, but Isia isn't sure. This isn't what she wanted. She then urges the other wardens to fight the bulk of the horde. As the fight goes on, Isia notices that Shrike is still fighting, with Denaro nowhere to be seen. The heedless aggression of his attack left him vulnerable to the Herlocks. As they got back to their feet, the smaller Darkspawn mobbed him, stabbing and slashing. Yet, somehow, Shrike managed to evade many of their blows. It was as if he knew before the Darkspawn did where they were going to strike. He could dodge or deflect their swings before they landed. 
Not always, there were too many, and Shrike wasn't about to give up his prey to avoid them, but it began to explain how he stayed in the fights as long as he had. Kaelin is quiet behind her, and Isia tells him to spit out whatever he is thinking. He tells her that this, what she has done, is dangerous. While she might not want this for other griffins, this is something others will. The horns then sound that the battle has been won as the Darkspawn begin to run from the battle. She looks down at Shrike, who had finally fallen. While Hosberg might be free today, and maybe in the next few weeks, months, maybe years, it would fall again. Isia believes Kaelin is right. Others will want the Griffins to fight like Shrike, but this is her spell. No one else knows how to do it, and she tells him that she will never do it again. Chapter 15, 941 Dragon. Valia asks Remus if she's ever known a blood mage. Over the past month, she has learned to accept the Templars and even has befriended Remus, joining her for morning tea for most days. A few weeks ago, the Templars began to keep to themselves, as Knight Lieutenant Degir had died during his joining. No one else had taken the right yet. Remus says as a Templar, any blood mage she found was normally afraid. Valia then rephrases her question, are all blood mages evil? Remus says that she isn't sure, but as a Templar, any Maleficar, regardless of the reason, was considered evil. But as she is not a Templar anymore, the answer is probably more complicated. Valia points out that the Grey Wardens have used blood magic, which makes her go quiet for a time, but later says that it's still a tool that destroys its user, much like the Taint. Valia wonders if the Knight Lieutenant's death had to do with his views on blood magic. Remus puts out her theory, that the joining ritual is unforgiving of weakness, and as he was full of doubt, the corruption got the best of him. Valia then asks her if she thinks Remus would survive, she says no. As she had a dedication to become a Templar, she doesn't have that same mindset for becoming a Grey Warden. Valia agrees with her, saying that she doesn't think she would make a good Warden, as she doesn't have the heart for what a Warden needs to do. Remus questions what she means, and for the first time, Valia tells another of Isia's journal. But she keeps the true identity of the author a secret. Garahel was the only hero the Elves of Thetis had. The only hero that the humans couldn't deny was a hero. Him having a blood mage for a sister would ruin that all. As an elf, she couldn't bring that shame on her people's only hero. She tells Remus that the warden whose diary she had read had done terrible things as a blood mage, but also a lot of good. And she wonders if her legacy should be buried because of her actions. And as a Templar, Remus would know the answer. I'm not a Templar anymore, Remus said. She spoke so quietly that it was almost a whisper, but the sound of her voice after such a long hush startled Valia. It's no longer my duty to stamp out Maleficarium, wherever it exists. There was something in her dark, perpetually wary eyes that Valia didn't know how to read. Hope, maybe, or resignation, or a little bit of fear? What does that mean? The elf asked. It means I'm allowed to see shades of grey, Remus answered. So maybe it is possible to do something good with blood magic. Maybe. What was this warden's legacy? Chapter 16 520 Exalted Three days after the Battle of Husburg, after scouts saw no sign of the Darkspawn returning, Queen Merwin called for a feast. Garahel had begun getting messages that the Archdemon, who was currently in the Free Marshes, had begun to act more aggressive after they had won the battle. The Wardens had finally made a major blow to the Darkspawn. But that meant the attacks on the Free Marshes were getting worse. Garahel and the other wardens need to go to the nation to help end the blight. The night before the feast, he tells them Modus and Issia that they are going to go to the feast and pay respects to the queen and leave for the free marches soon after, and the Anders will have to send forces with them. Issia points out that the Anders have been fighting for seven years. These people are tired. Amadis also pipes up that her group, the Ruby Drakes, are also tired. They have been paid with mostly promises up until now, and they are getting restless with the promise of coin rather than the real thing. While she has done her best to quell these unhappiness, her people need to see something more substantial to know that they will get paid royally once all this is over. Garahel is surprised at her words, but she continues. Queen Merwin's price is just you, isn't it? Your public obeisance at her feast and your company for a night. That's all she wants, for you to legitimize her rule and give her a little pleasure before you go. Yes, the elf said stiffly. He pushed the carafe away and stalked back to his chair, drinking the wine like water. I've made no secret of that. I told you the instant I received the offer. I told you I'd refuse, too. And I said you had to do it, Amada said, which you do. Her smile was sincere, not a natural expression for the fiery-tempered woman, and one which made Issia profoundly uncomfortable. It's a cheap price, really. I get you nightly, and I don't even have a crown. You do have an army, though, Garohel said. He finished the wine and, with a longing look at the carafe, set the empty glass aside. 
Maybe that's the only reason I let you take advantage of me so shamelessly. Maybe I just want the use of your ruby drakes. Maybe so, Amada agreed. But if you want to keep using them, you'll have to pay me a little better than that. I refuse to be bought for less than that throne-thieving harlot. Garahel clapped his hands. Ah, oh, at last we get to negotiating. Lovely. What's your price? I want a griffin, she said. Garahel's taken aback at her request. Amadis is not a warden and doesn't know how to ride a griffin. She shoots back that she has been with them for seven years and she'd like to think that she's learned just a few things about griffins. And the fact that she isn't a warden is the reason she wants one. She argues that if she was given a griffin, other mercenary captains will think that they might get the same and show that you make your promises in good faith. Plus, she wants a breeding female. The griffins are going to need to be repopulated and having another breeding colony wouldn't be a bad idea. Slowly, Garahel agrees with her. Modest finally leaves the two alone, saying that Garahel needs to look pretty for the queen. And he does. Isia thinks on how handsome her brother looks at the feast tonight, and it seems he is putting all his effort into winning the queen's favor. Amadis, sitting near the queen, sits in silence for most of the feast. She had made sure to dress as the exact opposite as the queen, donned in armor and her hair freshly cut short. Isia notes that her brother probably took notice, but hid it well. At the feast, Garahel makes a speech saying his plans to go quickly to the free marches to help end the blight. There is silence in the halls. Queen Merowyn stands up then, publicly promising the Anderfell support. Whatever promises were whispered between them in private, it seems it's working. Isia whispers to herself her doubt and is overheard by Caelan sitting next to her. Isia sighs and says all up to Garahel now, and Caelan wonders that her brother would really do anything to stop the blight. Isia questions him, saying that to stop the blight, wouldn't you do anything? Caelan looks down at his food. The servants were in such a rush to make the feast, it seemed they had missed a few feathers from the pigeons they were serving. He picks out a broken, messy feather from his meal and looks at her. No, there were some things he wouldn't do. Isia wonders what he means, but he says that she does know, or will soon. Chapter 17 520 Exalted Over breakfast the next morning, Garahel tells Isia that they do indeed have the Anderfell soldiers, much more than he had even dared to ask for. He wants to leave as soon as possible, and parts that the queen won't have time to change her mind. Isia asks if he has told Amadis yet. Garahel becomes sheepish, telling his sister that he isn't really sure how to tell her. Isia tells her brother that she isn't the one to ask, as she knows nothing on how to keep lovers happy. Garahel is surprised at that. He had thought that her and Kaylin had... But no, she denies any involvement with anyone. Are you that afraid of having your heart broken? Isia scowled. You've seen how quickly death comes on the field, Garahel. Who wants that? Who needs it? Our losses aren't bad enough without inviting that extra pain. I already have you to worry about in Ravaz. At least if my griffin goes down, I'll probably die with her, so that's some consolation. Neither of us will have to be alone. But the last thing I need when I go out there is someone else to fear. You don't need the strength of another soul to keep you going? I had you, she thought, but she didn't say it. Since childhood, Garahel had been with her, a protector when their parents vanished and left them to the uncertain mercies of a human society, a guide when her magical gifts made their first terrifying appearance, a comforting shoulder in the cold confines of the circle. He had come to the Grey Wardens with her, or she with him. It was hard to remember which it was now, if there ever had been a clear answer to that. And then they'd split apart. She couldn't begrudge him that, not really. He deserved happiness, and she liked Amadis. But she hated the hurt of parting. I have my griffin. Tells Garahel to take Amadis to find her griffin. It's the best gift anyone could get, and the best hope for his forgiveness. Even if it was Amadis' plan for Garahel to bed the queen, it didn't make it hurt any less. An hour later, Isia watches as Amadis flies by on her new griffin. She had chosen a young, gray female named Smoke. Her original rider had died about a month ago and was currently being used to carry messages back and forth for the wardens. Isia takes flight on Ravas then and rides out to a part of the Anderfells where the Blight had not quite destroyed it. In moments like these, she can almost think that the world is normal again, but it's just not quite right. Either way, she cherished moments like these and clings to them when times have been tough. Garahel and Amadis had gotten back before she had, and Isia finds their griffins, Crooky Tail and Smoke, enjoying a meal together. It seems their griffins have a fondness for each other as well. Isia heads to the kitchen for bread and wine when she is stopped by Kaelin. He informs her that they are being sent to Fortress Hain in the Vimark Mountains. Isia questions why there, and Caelan responds that Cumberland, Kirkwall, and Stirecaven are close to falling. Fortress Hain has yet to really see the blight, and is close enough to hold all the refugees. The warden commander of the area asks for Isia by name, hoping for her to use the same Aravels on those cities as she has used to save Wycombe all those years ago. 
When Issy arrives at the fortress, she notes that it really is in the middle of nowhere. Kayla notes that while it's run down, as the owner was killed by the Antivan crows almost 30 years ago, it's still in good shape. They will be able to make something solid out of its bones. As they examine the ruins, they are greeted by a friend of Issia's, a castle's dwarven warden named Agosa. The two hug with Agosa happy to see her. Issia asks how the progress has been going, and Agosa briefs her. They currently have two dozen people, half of which are wardens. Currently, their biggest flaw was lack of food and water. The next limiting factor was space. The village next to the fortress could hold maybe 2,000 people, but if the Darkspawn attacked, the fortress itself couldn't hold close to that amount. Issia wonders what to do, but Agosa replies that she has an idea. They should hide them in the mountain. Chapter 18, 520 Exalted. As field commander of Fortress Hain, Issia is surprised to find that she enjoys the work. For all the bad she has seen, the building of something new was refreshing. Agosa and her helped to hollow out the mountains. The large chunks were then used to rebuild parts of the fortress, and the smaller bits were used to pave the roads for the new village. Within two months, they had created enough space for their soon-to-be village to take shelter in. With one problem, they still didn't have enough water. The two wonder how to get water when Issia comes up with a solution. They can melt the ice on the top of the mountain. Three weeks of prep work later, Issia stands on the mountaintop, tied by a rope that is attached to Ravas. Using her magic, she strikes strategic places in the ice to create small avalanches to run down a tunnel that they have created. The ice will then fall in what will become a large lake. During the last of the blasts, her magic accidentally takes out a large chunk than expected, and she is swept away by the snow, only to be jerked back up to safety by Ravas. Half an hour later, Ravas stands in Fortress Hain, but not so gently for Issia, still dangling from the rope. She has to create a force field to stop her from smashing into a wall. Agosa meets her, but worry is written all over her face. The mission had clearly worked, so Issia is confused. Her friend tells her that the First Warden wants all the refugees to come at once, and come now. Garahel is waiting in the stateroom to brief her. Issia rushes and finds her brother leafing through an old book. The two hug, and she notes on how thin he has become. Garahel tells his sister that the Darkspawn have tricked the three cities of Kirkgall, Cumberland, and Starkhaven, circulating between the three of them and weakening them down, all the while letting the cities believe that they are fighting the Horde back, which instead, they're just really switching targets. The city leaders themselves refuse to believe this, so the Wardens want to evacuate all three now for safety. But the catch is, they cannot spare any forces. Issia only has herself and maybe ten Griffin riders to complete the mission. The cities will help defend the caravans going in and out of the area, but during their journey through Darkspawn-infested land, they're on their own. Issia is shocked. The mission is suicide and she doesn't have people to make that work, but Garahel says that she does. He pulls out a bag and Issia notices the insides are materials for a joining ritual. It dawns on her what that means. It's the only way, her brother said. She couldn't believe the words she was hearing. From the look on his face, he couldn't believe he was saying them, but they kept coming. We don't have a choice. We must evacuate those cities, and we must do it with a small, mobile force. You don't have many griffins, and most of them are injured. But if you can do to them what you did with Shrike, they'll fight like ten times their number and their injuries won't matter. There is no other way to save the free marshes, Issia. I couldn't keep your secret. Not if it meant all those thousands of people would die. The First Warden has given the order. But the Griffins of Fortress Hain through the joining. Discussion. When Valia is helping the Chamberlain with his letters, he mentions Warden Commander Corell and how she isn't writing. If you don't remember, this is the Grey Warden leader that is being manipulated by one of Corypheus's agents in Dragon Age Inquisition. He also mentions Vigil's Keep had sent a letter, but more importantly, that there is a new Warden Commander. Now, this is actually one of the things that was asked of the author on the Bioware social network forums, but she basically dodged the question on who the Warden Commander is. But one would think that it wouldn't be either the Hero of Herelden or the Elysian Warden from Dragon Age Awakening, as at this point in time, whoever held the position there would have had it for almost 10 years. As Wardens do have a shorter lifespan, I don't think any Warden who has been serving for almost a decade would be called new in their position. So too long didn't read, whoever you're playing in Awakening is no longer at Vigil's Keep. The way Remus talks about her father's abilities is kind of odd. Eggs under the hens would freeze, torches would burn blue, the kids would see faces in the fire, hear voices around the house. This speaks of a much more dangerous scenario than what you usually hear in the Dragon Age world, where mage abilities are often controlled with emotions and don't seem to do such odd passive effects. 
This is honestly something I would like to see more of, untrained mages accidentally causing odd things to happen and not just them becoming demons. Anana says, is it just me or Kaelin's confession to Isia that he is in fact a blood mage too fast? Like he didn't even try to deny it, not even once. This whole convert seemed unnatural to me. Like I have no problem with Isia looking for unconventional solutions, that's understandable, just the way the conversation unravels, but maybe seven years into the blight changes how people talk about these things. I wonder if part of that is that he has feelings for her, and after seven years he respects her enough to not lie about it. The book mentions that he knows she won't turn him in, and so there isn't really a reason to lie to her, and she gives a solid reasoning on how she found out. He's stuck, and denying it would make him seem foolish, so I don't really mind the scene, but I do think it happened all very fast. I, if anything, in just how it was presented to us. I would really like to see Isia's realization that he was a blood mage rather than her describing how she found out. This is perhaps nitpicky, but the reasoning that Isia is the only one to seriously consider cutting off reinforcements to the Darkspawn seems unlikely to me. If anything, after seven years, I would have thought that they would have started to try anything much sooner than that. It's really not that unreasonable of an idea. You have winged beasts that are able to spy from above, and later on we learn that they do have spy glasses, so is, is it really that hard to send out some scouts to see where the Darkspawn are coming from? The novel sets up that Isia and Kaelin would make a good couple, and I don't exactly disagree either to be honest, but it should be noted that there is a large age gap between them. Granted, we don't know the exact age gap, but it mentions that Kaelin has been a blood mage for about 20 years, and his hair is already graying quite a bit. We don't actually know Isia's age, but during their time at Hosberg, she describes her brother as being barely over 30. Now, we aren't sure if they are twins or one is older or the other is younger, but Isia might be a few years older or younger than that. So, to me, it sounds like there's about a 10 to 15 age gap between them. I, I don't really know what that means, I just don't really like large age gaps in my ships, but that's- that. there you go, fun facts. I'll be very blunt. I have a problem with Lisme, in that they are over-described and underused. Almost every part that has Lisme in it, we get a decently long description on what they are wearing that day and what gender they are presenting as, even if it seems to be a small scene. That being said, I don't necessarily mind these parts. The costuming is interesting and I like hearing about it, but when what one person is described so intricately, while literally no one else is, it just feels really odd. We know more about what Liz May looks like on multiple days than Valia. I also don't think I would have such a problem with their over descriptions if they were a more major character, but they just aren't. I'll get into this more in the next episode, but I'm just kind of frustrated by Lisme. It's a unique character concept that ended up being a really minor side character. When talking about ways to help Shrike, Denaro actually mentions the mysterious flower in Ferelden that cured the Mabari and Dragon Age origins, but that it's nothing more than a children's story, and if it did exist, it would have been gobbled up by now. So up until now, we never actually knew what the exacts of what goes into the cup during adjoining is. But all Isia uses is Darkspawn blood, a drop of Archdemon blood, and Lyrium. But in other sources in the series, a mix of herbs is used as well. It's possible that the herbs are not necessary, or even that the herbs are only used for the humans, or just that the writer simply didn't wish or didn't know to add them. It might even be that the herbs are a more recent change to the joining process. We don't really know. While an interesting scene, I have a bit of a problem with how Isia put Shrike through the joining. She knows that past griffins who went through the process went absolutely crazy, tore everything and everyone apart, yet when she attempts it, she never prepares to fail. For the woman who is always looking at the what ifs and if, if things fail, I'm honestly surprised she wouldn't even consider tying him up or making sure at least Kaelin could kill the beast if something went wrong. It just seemed really out of character for her. Fortress Hain might sound familiar to you. It is indeed the same place that you visit in Dragon Age 2 DLC, Mark of the Assassin, Chateau Hain. In this novel, you get to see the construction of the underground tunnels that Hawk fights through in the last part of the DLC. It's also the time where we introduce the new characters that were brought in during these chapters. Again, this is only the ones that were in more than one scene, described, and have a name. There are actually no new characters in the present parts, but plenty in the past. The past. Warden Felice, red-haired griffin rider, dies along with her griffin when collapsing the opening to the deep roads. Warden Tunk and Warden Monk, two dwarven warriors that really just are there and vomit while in the air. Warden Denaro, 
The Griffin Rider, whose mount was given the first Griffin joining, died when his Griffin disobeyed orders and went berserk on the Darkspawn. Warden Lisme, a gender-fluid mage that uses unique makeup to change their looks depending on how they feel, has a strong hatred for Darkspawn. Lady Commander Uvashaw, leader of the Anderfels Royal Army and the one really leading the nation during the time of the Blight. Queen Regent Merowyn, widowed queen of the Anderfels and mother, she is petty, holding over her troops for a night with Garahel. Warden Agosa, a castless dwarven woman who had abandoned all of her traditions in favor of chastened ones. And with that, thank you to everyone who submitted entries, and I look forward to what everyone comes up with next. If you have any comments, artwork, or anything else, please send it in. Our next and final section will consist of chapters 19 to 25 of Last Flight. So please send me your things in by March 3rd, 2019. Either comment below, send me an email at guildathon at gmail.com, tweet at guildathon on Twitter, or PM user Gillanon on Reddit. Dress your all.